Welcome back. We hope you had a great break and were able to refresh. We're really looking forward to uh, the afternoon session. We've got some great stuff lined up. First, uh, a fireside chat with Suda May, and then we'll have our poster session, which will give us more opportunities to interact with each other um, and engage. And then uh, following that, at the end of the day, we have our networking session. Uh, so really uh, looking forward to lots of chances to have conversations and, and meet new people and uh, uh, discuss research. So to start with, um, we're delighted to have Suda May here with us. Uh, she is uh, currently the uh, managing um, director of Microsoft Research Labs in New England, New York and Montreal. So she has a, a unique position spanning three uh, different labs, which makes her a very busy person traveling to and, and fro. Um, she's one of the most highly cited researchers uh, in MSR and has received uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards from uh, SIGCHI and SIGIR. Uh, and her, her research is uh, really a, a fantastic example of interdisciplinary um, research. And so look forward to discussing that more as we get into our conversation. She's also a member of the CHI Academy, SIGIR Academy, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an ACM Fellow. Uh, so really just an amazing body of work uh, that she's contributed. So welcome, Su Susan. Thanks, Daniel. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And welcome to all the, the visitors from many different uh, universities in the US and, and beyond, I believe. Absolutely. Uh, so to start off with, could you uh, tell us a little about yourself and about your journey to MSR and in research as a whole. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting. When I was growing up, I, I aspired to, to do lots of different things, but I can certainly assure you that uh, being a technical fellow at Microsoft or the director of three Microsoft research labs was not among them. So I grew up in Maine uh, in an industrial mill town. I was the first in my family to, to go to college. I went to a small liberal arts school, Bates College, which turned out to be only a few doors uh, away from where I grew up. When, when I went to college, I had the intention of, of going to law school to study environmental law. And so I majored in math because I was uh, pretty good at it. And it also allowed me to the opportunity, since it didn't have all that many requirements, to take lots of, of other courses. Um, and there was a, a moment when I was a, a junior, I took a course in mathematical psychology, would, now would be called cognitive science. And I was just fascinated by the possibilities of understanding human intellect by being able to quantitatively model things like human memory, learning, perception. And so I, I just ditched the plans to go to law school and decided to take GREs and go to graduate school in, in cognitive science. And uh, you know, while I was in graduate school there, I did a lot of work in human memory and perception, also work in uh, visual motor development in, in young infants. And I was all set to be a professor at uh, a university. That's what I thought I would do after graduate school. Um, but alas, I had another change in plan. So just as I was going on the, uh, the job market, Bell Labs was starting a, the very first human computer interaction group in industry. Tom Landauer was starting that and hired a handful of people. And in the end, I just decided it was a tremendous opportunity to be at the beginning of something completely different, uh, work with an amazing set of colleagues in, in different areas. And I thought, figured if I didn't like it, I could leave in a, a few years. It's been uh, almost 40 years since that time now. So you, I guess I can say that I liked uh, the industrial research uh, lifestyle and in, environment. When I was at, at Bell Labs, one of the things I worked on was a system, a or very early word embedding system called latent semantic indexing, which to this day still accounts for a huge proportion of my, my citations. And for those of you who are familiar with today's deep learning models, this was about as polar opposite as you can get. It was a very simple linear factorization model trained on tiny amounts of data with very little compute and a few hundred parameters. Uh, but even with these limitations, the model was able to successfully improve information retrieval. We actually tried something having to do with human parity. We had it. Uh, we had the system take the test of English as a foreign language, and it did as well as the average test taker. And so there was uh, some real promise in, in this method. Um, and I guess finally, 23 years ago, I, I joined 
in Microsoft Research, where I've been since. And at Microsoft, I've worked on lots of different projects, as Daniel alluded to, at the intersection of human-computer interaction, information retrieval, and, and AI. I thought I'd just mention a, you know, a few of the things that I've really enjoyed uh, doing it at Microsoft, and, and then um, uh, and then reflect on sort of what I'm currently doing. The very first project I actually worked on was with an, an intern, my first uh, intern at Microsoft, a guy named Maran Sahami, who's now uh, on the faculty at Stanford, along with uh, David Heckerman and Eric Horvitz. We worked on what was probably the first email spam filter. This was back in 1997. Um, and the system spun out to be actually a product that was offered in, in Outlook Online. And I think it's been operational for almost 20 years. It's probably one of the longest uh, living AI systems, if, if you will. Um, a couple of other things I've, I've worked on that I really enjoyed, again, are at the intersection of people and algorithms. Uh, the first is a system called Stuff I've Seen, which created quite literally a unified index to help people find any information they'd seen regardless of where they had seen it, you know, whether it was an email on the web, in a document. Um, and you know, at that time, the gateway that people had to most information was really from a single desktop machine. So our task was quite easy from a, an infrastructure point of view, and we concentrated a lot on user experience and in interfaces. Um, today, this task, I think, has become much more complicated with a proliferation of devices that we all own, a ton of web services, but it's still a capability that I really need and, and miss uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, let me just uh, talk a little bit about a lot of, of work that I've done with many folks at, at Microsoft and in several different product groups on um, context and personalization in search. And again, the idea is really quite simple, and it's, it's simply that one size doesn't fit all in web search. Um, and by that, what I mean is that what's relevant to the same query will vary depending on who's asking it, you know, what they've done in the immediate past, what their longer term interests and preferences are. It'll vary depending on when they ask it, where they are, and, and so on. And representing this kind of contextual metadata makes it much easier to do this challenging task of taking 2.3 words and making any sense of it. So in answering people's really short web queries. And so that spans some of the, the things I've, I've done at, at Microsoft from algorithms to uh, search related applications and experiences. And I now spend, as, as Daniel said, most of my time doing much less uh, research on my own and, and more time on technical leadership and, and lab, lab management, which I really like in, in very, very different ways. Great, thank you for that overview. And uh, previous to your current role, you were the Assistant Director of MSRAI. Um, and just yeah. thinking at a, at a high level, given your um, you, you know, fantastic experience over the past 20, 30 years, kind of looking at uh, AI problems, what do you think are the really key accomplishments that you've seen and the biggest challenges or opportunities moving forward? Yeah, um, that, that's a really broad question, and I, I guess I could answer it in, in lots of ways. But let me focus on um, what I'll call the first decade of the, the deep learning revolution. Uh, and so I, yeah, I think it's amazing for uh, people who've been in graduate school throughout the, the deep learning uh, decade to realize that we're only, uh, you know, really eight or nine years into using deep learning techniques at a, a scale and uh, and a, a, and applications that have become really, really commonplace. So there are a ton of amazing accomplishments, some huge challenges, and uh, MSR is really trying to bridge the gap between aspirations and, and experiences. Let me just talk you know, a little bit about the, the course of, of progress in, in speech recognition and, and maybe language understanding. So if, for, if you plot Example, for example, something like word error rate in speech recognition systems, things like the switchboard collection from, from NIST, what you see is a lot of progress from 1990 to about 2000, and then a huge plateau for about a decade. And then all of a sudden in about 2009, 2009 I guess it was, George Dahl, Jeff Hinton, and uh, spent the summer at, at MSR, 
and doing work on deep acoustic modeling for automatic speech recognition, I couldn't imagine that they could make any progress given really the decades that folks at Bell Labs and other places had spent fine tuning uh, features for speech recognition. Um, but you know, they, they pro definitely proved me wrong. And what really changed during that time and over the next three years was just that there was a lot more training data. There were really much richer and deep models um, and a lot more compute. And so you saw progress again from 2009 to maybe 2015 take a, um, you know, a, a huge, just huge advantages in, in progress in, in that area. And also, you know, in, in language representation, uh, I alluded to early some of the work that I had done back in the 1990s on uh, language modeling. Um, and that you know, was based on a very, very small amount of data. Uh, Yashua Bengio picked up some of those ideas around 2003, I guess it was, uh, building a, a feed forward net neural language model. And he used uh, probably two orders of magnitude more data, uh, three orders of magnitude more parameters in, in this model and showed some progress, but it still wasn't um, you know, showing the, the kinds of progress and robustness that, that one would like to deploy it at, at scale. And so, uh, you know, it was another decade before 2013 when word to vec became uh, more popular. And again, there was a two order of magnitude increase in the number of words and the number of model parameters. Um, and there were some really interesting applications of that. But a lot of the progress has happened really just in the last two or three years where we've gone, again, several orders of magnitude, not now not decade after decade, but almost year after year. And so I, I think this, um, you know, the, these new models that are based on using a ton of data, really rich transformer style models with a, a tension, um, there have been just tremendous accomplishments that are enabled by this. So, you know, you pick up this, this phone, I can talk to it and the speech is recognized. We see image captioning, natural language understanding and generation machine translation, even things going from real-time translation from one language to another that is powered by many of these capabilities. And I think these are just amazing things that, that we take for granted. Um, you know, as a community, we should be really proud of that. But the systems also have a ton of limitations and these are starting to, to surface. You know, they can be biased, they can be very fragile, uh, subject to adversarial noise where changes that are completely invisible to, to humans, uh, dramatically change the recognition class of, of items. These systems in many ways have really, say narrow web wedges of competency. They're very good at a small task, often driven by available test collections. Um, you know, and in many senses, they're, they're doing a really good job of memorizing a lot of patterns. And those get you a long way but I think what we're you know, lacking uh, here is really the ability to, to generalize in a variety of interesting new directions. So you know, some of the work that, that we're doing at MSR AI, I think lays the foundation for a variety of new approaches to address these limitations. And I hope that you've had some opportunities to you know, hear about some of the work on theoretical foundations that underlie these empirical successes. Um, I think all of the models need to be much more robust to changes um, in distribution into unknown unknowns. I think increasingly people are developing not these wedges of uh, expertise, but more universal models, uh, universal representation across different tasks, um, across generation and understanding, across different modalities. Uh, and I think you know increasingly we're seeing models that don't live in a test collection, but are grounded in the real world and leverage some higher level representations uh, based on prior knowledge, um, look at entities and, and different levels of abstraction. So I think those are really uh, important new directions. And we're doing a lot of that in, uh, you know, at Microsoft and in Microsoft AI. I'd be, uh, you know, a little bit remiss not to, to mention that above and beyond these challenges in uh, and progress in, in capabilities, 
I think we as a community also just need to do a much better job of thinking about learning with better sample efficiency and thinking about building models that can be served um, at a cost that's just not prohibitively expensive. So I think, uh, you know, as I outlined at the, at the beginning, there's been a tremendous set of accomplishments that power all sorts of things that we take for granted. Now, grandchildren who cannot imagine that you can't pick up your phone, speak a question and get results back instantaneously, 24 by seven. So it's powered a lot of um, great accomplishments, but I think there are also some fragilities that work on things like robustness, universal representations, and uh, grounding and abstraction will, will really help move uh, us into to new directions. That's great. That's Thanks. Great. Yeah, fantastic answer. And uh, looking now to your current role and, and kind of your transition to now direct yeah. uh, three three labs um, in the in the northeast of North America, um, it, how's that experience been, and 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 what excites you about that new challenge? Yeah, um, you know, I think the best word to to describe it is uh, it's been exhilarating. I started uh, this new role at the end of of January, and the first month uh, was uh, amazing fun. Uh, I traveled to all three of the labs multiple times. I got to know people, project, and and aspirations. Uh, there have been a number, and then COVID hit, right? And so there have been a number of interesting challenges. We all started working from home. Uh, in the U.S., there are ongoing civil and, and political challenges. There are natural disasters from hurricanes to fires. Um, you know, and even to, to make things more interesting, two of those labs moved to new locations during the pandemic. I've never been in either lab. Uh, and so really looking forward to, to be able to, to getting back to that. So it's you know it's been a, a fun journey, one that I'm really glad I, I took on. Uh, let me say a little bit more about the labs and and what excites me about them. So the I mean the three labs started at, at different times. They're all relatively new. So the New England lab started um, 2008, so it's not even teenager yet. The New York lab in in 2012, and the Montreal lab only three years ago. And each has a somewhat different culture and and mix of topical foci. Uh, but what all three labs share is something that I really value and that we both alluded to is that they are highly interdisciplinary. Um, and that is they, they more than many um, university departments, many industrial research labs, they bring together people and perspectives from computer science, from economics, from social sciences, uh, and more recently from biological sciences to carry out uh, really exciting world-class interdisciplinary work that I think um, can impact and shape Microsoft, the scientific community, and and more broadly uh, society. And you know, one of the reasons I think this is so important to take these broad perspectives is if you want to solve some of today's really pressing problems whether they're technical or, or societal, it's not enough to just build this really fancy and cool algorithm, right? You need to understand much more about the socio-technical environment in which systems are deployed, the co-evolution of things like work practices and systems. Um, even something seemingly as simple as web search that I've done a lot of work on, it's not enough to have a great algorithm that, that takes a query and matches it to billions of web pages. I mean, that's an astounding capability, but it's not enough to have a successful system or service. I mean, you need to do things like help people articulate what they're looking for. And we do that in a variety of ways. You need to help people make sense of the results in interesting ways. Um, if you're providing the service, you need to deal with a constant uh, barrage of adversaries. And so there's so much more that, that goes on in building and deploying systems at, at scale that, um, I think the the more perspectives that we bring to bear on that, the more successful we'll be. And that's what I'm most excited about, I'd say about the the three Northeast labs is that they all have this super interesting mix of uh, computational sciences, social sciences, economics, and uh, maybe biological sciences. So it's really fun to to see people from those different communities coming together. That's great. What, what do you think it is about the culture at those labs that makes 
it's so successful that those types of projects are successful is it is it that the, the people or, or how they you know how those projects are, are born or you know is it something else is it location to great universities on the east coast like what, what, what are the key things that, that make it successful yeah i i think it was a, a lot of it was very uh, deliberate to when the new york when the new england lab was was founded it was very very deliberately done to mix computer science economics and social sciences and so the lab brought together uh, people with each of those those different perspectives uh, similarly when the new york lab started it already had a mix of uh, it, it started in, in large part from uh, folks who had previously been at, at Yahoo, and there was really interesting work there in machine learning, computational social sciences, and computational economics. And so uh, in both cases, the seed of the labs was, was people who came from really different perspectives uh, and had you know, the, the, the labs are sort of the small, I'd say each one is 35 to 35 ish 40 people and so you get to know each other as individuals you develop i'd say mutual respect for the perspectives that that different people bring and um you know i think have an openness to looking at at problems from multiple different perspectives and and really engaging with others again as i said you know it's not enough to have a great algorithm you can have the world's best learning algorithm it can be on top of leaderboards but unless you think about how something, the bigger um, environment in which things are going to be deployed, it, it uh, it's not very successful. And so for me, for me, a lot of it was intentional. I think um, the people who hi were hired and who continue to be hired uh, are people who are open to new ideas, thrive in an environment where there are people with different perspectives. And, um, and so a lot of it in involves around getting to know each other and really, most importantly, just having um, mutual respect for each other's perspectives and learning from that. And so I think it's a really, really fun. Both, all of them are really, really fun places to, to be. Thanks. Um, a question coming from Tom in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the audience. So what ways, what are the ways of thinking that you have found most uh, successful in terms of, you know, figuring out the questions to ask in your, in your work and also as a you know director now of labs and and, and you have influence yeah. over what questions are asked by researchers in those labs how do you approach that um yeah part of my philosophy as a, a lab director is you hire really um talented people who have some of the you know certainly good core technical skills but also approaches to problems um, that will be successful and really just get the heck out of the way and, and uh, support them. Um, but it, I guess when I, um, you know, when I think about um, what makes people successful in, in not just, uh, you know, research in industry, but in, in research in, in general is, um, I think, it, as you said, asking the, the right questions. And so one of the things I always do when I start a problem and I encourage people in the labs to do is ask yourself, uh, if I were work really hard and, and solve this problem, who will care? Okay, and sometimes the answer might be my three best friends because it's a beautiful theoretical problem. In my case, it might be my th three or four best friends who are metrics wonks like I am and care detailed about measurements, care in, you know, in the same detail as I do about measurement and, uh, uh, and robustness. But more often than not, I, I really care about seeing systems used much more broadly, uh, both in the you know, community and within in practice. And so uh, I think by being clear on you know, what your goals are, what the upside is, set yourself up really well for having that that broader impact that's great and uh yeah segueing from that into another question from samiha uh, what is your vision of ai in 20 years time do what are the things that you think we will will have been solved or have been addressed and, and how will those matter to society 
Yeah. Um, well, I, as I as I said before, you know, I think we we need to develop systems that are really quite different than than we have now. There, there's amazing capabilities. Um, I I think we will will see systems that are uh, certainly less brittle, that maybe learn a little bit more in the ways that that humans learn with smaller sample sizes, that have the ability to uh, generalize in um, useful ways, have multiple. If you think about people, we have multiple levels of, of representation. Certainly how we process signals in vision, language, speech, depend on the raw sensory motor um, channel. But above that, there's a level of abstraction, which brings all of that together in a way that allows us to, um, to generalize, to learn more efficiently, uh, and so on. And I think we'll, we'll see systems have some of those capabilities of operating more robustly in the open world, of continuously learning, um, of being, again, not islands of competency, but interacting with other agents, interacting with people. And so I think we'll, you know, we'll see a lot more uh, robustness in, in an open world. And uh, that's going to allow us to solve all sorts of, of things from uh, multi-agent systems to systems that address some of, uh, you know, the biggest challenges that, that we face as a, uh, as the computer science profession and really as a society. <clears throat> Sorry, because many of those challenges are not things that you can come up with a nice, neat, tidy test collection for. And so, again, I think it's, um, you know, thinking about building things that that interoperate with with people, with other agents, um, and doing so in, in a way that is, um, let's say, less fragile than many of our current systems. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, conversation and we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, just yeah. one fun question from Kira. Yeah. Uh, of the three labs, which, if, if, if we weren't working remotely, which, which is the one that you would be based at? Maybe, you know, which is the city you prefer putting you on the spot here? You can't ask me that. I guess which is the <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I have a lot of frequent flyer miles. I'm, my, I spend, my main office is in um, the New England lab, and that's partly because it was the first lab when I was getting up and, and running. It's a place where a lot of, of people in the business administration side of things in, uh, and so on were based. And so for me, it was the, the, the place where I felt I could get the biggest fire hose of, of new information. Um, but I, you know, I visited in one month uh, each of the other labs two times, and uh, before the pandemic hit, I had hoped to spend, you know, about a week a month in Redmond, a week a month in, uh, you know, New England, and then uh, a week split between uh, New York and Montreal, and a, a week somewhere else traveling. But uh, those those plans have uh, taken a bit of a, a left turn. But I hope to get back to to doing that, to uh, being in in all the labs, and uh, you know, learning from each of them and, um, and so I don't I don't have a favorite they're all amazing in their own ways <laughs> very diplomatic thank you um, thank you once again for your time and uh, for being involved um, so thank okay. you too. yeah thanks for organizing and to all of the the students in, involved have a, a great rest of the the, the day and, and day tomorrow and I'll see you at the the poster session sh shortly I think Sean is gonna tell us about how to get there yeah, great transition. Uh, so passing over to Sean now, who's going to um, lead us into the poster session. Great. Yeah, and thanks so much, Sue, for, for coming. It seems like these half hour chats fly by in about 30 seconds. <laughs> I wish they could be like 90 minutes. Um, but thanks for coming. That was a great chat. Um, so for, for everyone who's watching right now, we are about to transition into uh, the interactive poster session. So before we do that, um, and this broadcast stream will, will end in a few moments, but I want to show you, uh, just so everyone's on the same page, kind of how to do that, um, so everyone knows where everything is. Um, so I assume you're seeing my screen right now. Um, so on the main page of Hub, I mean, there's a there's a whole tab for the for the poster sessions, um, which is going to give you a, a list of the the agenda of every every. Um, students poster, each of which has its own page. 
Um, so you can, you know, find yourself. You can, you can, you can search, search or filter, filter um, to, to find, find your own name or to find the name of a person that you'd like to see their poster. Um, click into it and you'll see um, maybe a, a video if they've submitted a video for it, um, the poster itself, um, which you can also download uh, by clicking at the bottom of the page. Um, and you can also jump into a, a, the Teams meeting. There's been one Teams call set up per poster um, by clicking on this link here. I'm not going to click it now because it would <laughs> jump out of here. Um, and so just to clarify again, we're asking, I mean, basically all students, you're, you're welcome to be sitting in your Teams meeting, chatting with people for the whole time, um, 1.30 to 3. If you want to jump around to other posters, we're just asking for um, if your last name starts with letter A through M, um, be in your, your call from 1.30 to 2.30. And if your last name starts um, with the letters N through Z, um, try to be in your call from 2 to 3 um, so people can jump in and, and have conversations with you. Um, and then just a last note for the, the student attendees. Um, on the agenda after the poster session, um, we're going to be doing um, a networking game, um, which you can find here. This Mingler Bingo, we'll explain more about that. Uh, when it starts at three o'clock but to join you can go to the agenda in hub and again just click this join microsoft teams online um, and we'll have we'll meet you there um, in that meeting okay so that's it um, can't wait to see all of your posters and uh, talk to you soon thanks everyone